My name is Jelena Havelka. I work at the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds. And in this podcast, I'm going to talk about cognitive consequences of bilingualism as one of the currently quite lively issues and debates in psychology. This podcast will have three parts in which I'm going to discuss following topics. First topic will be definition of bilingualism and description of different types of bilingualism. The second topic will deal with the process of becoming bilingual or also is known as a process of second language learning. And then finally, I'm going to consider some of the cognitive consequences of bilingualism on a language system and on cognitive system in general. So let's start with the first topic of the podcast, which is definition and types of bilingualism. Before I start, I would like to say a few words about why would we care? Why do we want to study bilingualism and second language acquisition? Well, there are many reasons, but I'm going to sum up two main ones. First one is that simply most of world population is bilingual or multilingual. As you can see from the map, uh, all the colored parts represent the countries that are effectively functionally bilingual. And some of them, like the ones marked in purple, are even officially declared themselves as being multilingual. Now, given that are higher cognitive functions such as thinking and problem solving and reasoning and memory are largely mediated through language use. It is logical to ask whether being able to speak more than one language is going to have effect on how these functions work and how do we proceed thinking or remembering things if our knowledge is coded in more than one language. So if we want to have general theory of a human mind, we have to be mindful that sometimes that mind speaks with more than one language. The other reason is somewhat more applied. Simply, so many people want to learn languages because they want to travel, because they need it for work, etc. And here I have example of the numerical distribution of four most dominant languages in the world and the number of people who speak them as their first and as their second language. As you can see, a lot of people want to learn other languages, which is why understanding how we do that can help us improve educational practices and make the process that anybody who has tried learning another language as an adult knows can be somewhat slow, often boring and a bit painful. Now, we can classify times of bilinguals in different ways, and I will start off by classifying them according to the time in the life when they have learned their other language. We have first early bilingualism, where people, in this case children, infants, learn all of their languages at the same time, and it's often referred to as simultaneous bilingualism. So this is the case where it's almost incorrect to refer to something as the first and second language because all of them are acquired in parallel. Children simply are acquiring language and they'll acquire as many as they're exposed to, as simple as that. But then we have the other kind, which is late bilingualism, where the second language, or third or fourth, depending how ambitious people are, is acquired considerably later than the first language and often it's referred to as a consecutive bilingualism. Important distinction we need to bear in mind between the two is while early bilinguals simply pick up the languages as anybody does when learning their native language and babies simply don't mind how many they're learning, late bilinguals have fully formed the structure of the first language before they start building another language on the top of it. We can also classify bilinguals according to the degree of competence they have in their respective languages. There are people, not many of them, that can be regarded as balanced bilinguals, where both languages are proficient to the same level and there is nothing in the way they speak, write, understand spoken language that would distinguish between them and somebody who is purely monolingual. But then there are other people who are able to speak at a high functional level two languages, but yet they're going to be more dominant in one of them. Often the dominant language tend to be first one acquired in life, but it's not necessarily the case. If a child moves from one country to another and start dominantly functioning second language, the odds are it may become their dominant language. Now, 
I have mentioned different types of bilinguals and that leads us to the question, well, who are the people we can consider as being bilingual? Because obviously it's not quite a simple way of defining it as there are all these different types depending on how they've learned it, when they learned it, how well they know it. Very strict uh, definition would consider that the person should be considered as bilingual only if their competence in all of their languages is native-like. There is nothing in the vocabulary, in their accent or anything else that can distinguish them from a monolingual. That is not the definition we'll use because it's too narrow and excludes a number of people who are functionally bilingual and the fact they speak more than one language does have consequences on the functioning of their language system and other aspects of their cognitive system. On the other hand, we can be quite loose with our definition and say that, well, any skills, no matter how minimal in another language, are enough to consider somebody as bilingual. Well, that's not good, again, because being able to order food and coffee and say hello, thank you and goodbye while traveling to a foreign country is not quite enough to be considered bilingual. To be considered bilingual, one needs to be able to maintain at least some kind of basic levels of communication and social interaction. In other words, we are going to consider a bilingual person somebody who is using or is able to use two or more languages on a regular basis for a basic level of social interaction. Of course, somebody can stand and discuss philosophy in their different languages and that person will be regarded as more proficient. The other person may chat only about the weather, but still they are able to converse and maintain a conversation, therefore we will consider them as bilingual.